So this is my talk on human interfaces for geeks. It actually comes with a warning. Um, this is a talk which I originally gave about five or six years ago before I had facial hair. <laughs> so if you see any pictures in here of this strange looking pasty white guy, like who looks like he spent all of his time in like, you know, his parents' basement, that's actually me. So, so that is an advanced warning. So this is a talk on, on human interfaces for geeks. And um, when you hear the phrase human interface, uh, particularly at a tech conference, a lot of people think of this sort of thing. Um, keyboards, mice, things that you can use to interact with technology. Um, if you're me and you spend too much time watching science fiction, you think that something like this would be awesomely cool. <laughs> That's what I look like without facial hair as a Borg. But all of those are examples of human computer interfaces. And that's not what I want to be talking about today. I want to be talking about human interfaces, how humans interact with each other. Now, humans actually have a whole bunch of interfaces. Um, I'm using one right now to communicate with you. And that's, that's sound and hearing. So a lot of our communication is verbal sound communication with other people. But we have other interfaces as well. We have tactile interfaces. Um, they can be used to convey subtle messages, or they can be used to convey very obvious messages. <laughs> we have uh, visual communication. I'm using a lot of that there. And there's a whole bunch of other interfaces. Some of them are really fun, but I'm not going to talk about them in this talk. <laughs> so why? Why do you care about interfacing with humans? Well, unfortunately, we're still in this age where we have to talk to people occasionally. I would love to be in a world, I would love to be in a world where we didn't have to talk to humans, where we could make a choice to talk to humans, but we don't need to. But unfortunately, we're in a world where we have to. And if you get it wrong, if you mess up the protocols that humans use, then things can go horribly wrong for you. And that's something you don't want to happen. I love these photos. <laughs> so one thing that you might discover, um, or one thing that I discovered, it's very easy to be uncomfortable when you're interacting with other people, particularly strangers. And um, this is not something which ever came naturally to me. Um, interacting with strangers was something I actually had to learn. And um, when I was sort of growing up, I had these very sort of um, atypical communication styles. Um, you see these a lot in the tech community. We don't always communicate the same way that other people communicate. And, and these are not the communication styles we always want to be using. Um, so the big problem I had was dealing with typical people, people outside the tech community. And, and the big thing which sort of worried me at first, social conventions. Oh my goodness me, I did not understand social conventions. Why is it that this person is bringing a gift to that person? Why is it this person is doing this other sort of thing? The one that confused me all the time, how are you today? When I'm asked that by the person who's serving me coffee, the chances are they don't actually care. They don't want, I learned this the hard way, they don't want the 30 minute talk about, oh, I had a terrible day at work, but I'm thinking about building this code and it works really well, but it doesn't work with this version of the kernel, I don't know why. They don't care. <laughs> they really don't care. This is a packet of information which says, I would like to be able to communicate with you. And unless the person is your friend, that's what it means. The correct response to that is an acknowledgement that you know that they want to communicate and that you're also willing to communicate. <laughs> and then, because we finally figured this out, they give you the acknowledgement back there. You've completed the verbal handshake. You can now have a conversation and tell them what sort of coffee you want to order. The gotcha is that a lot of typical people then follow this up with this. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Why do I care about the weather? I don't know. So fundamentally, I found for a long time, humans did not make sense. And they didn't make sense even though we have the source code. <laughs> because that's the first thing I do. Let's look at the source code. Let's read the comments. <laughs> We don't come with keeper lives? 
on the weather? You have to, you have to do, how's the weather? Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time thinking about humans, and I actually discovered some humans make sense. And I actually found a class of humans that are really, really easy to study, and you can perform experiments of them without breaking ethics. That's a very important thing. So you might be wondering who? They're the Sims. <laughs> so this is what I call research. Oh no, I'm doing research on human psychology. I'm playing the Sims. It is the best selling PC game of all time. The Sims was wildly successful. And what it did is it modeled these virtual humans. But the reason it was so popular is that very fundamentally, they act human. If you watch The Sims doing things, they have these very recognizable behaviors. They even have like these very recognizable, they all speak in Simlish, but you can kind of understand the intent of what they're saying. So they make sense. Why do they make sense? So one thing, obviously everybody here must play The Sims, and of course when you play The Sims, you turn all of your friends into Sims characters. So that's Michael Schwern as a Sims character. <laughs> the important thing is that with Sims, You've got this section down here, these little status bars. I've got wants, I've got fears, I've got needs. I've got, also got other things like experience points and stuff, which you know, people may not have, um, but I've got those important status bars. So when they act a particular way, I can look at those status bars to figure out why. Now normal people, here is a normal person without facial hair. If this person is really rude to you or really gruff or just like blows you off or something, you might go, wow, that's so rude. But if you could see the status bars, <laughs> then you would notice down here, this caffeine bar is dangerously low. They're about to die. <laughs> so unless you're like putting coffee in their face, they don't want to deal with you. And that's actually something which is very, very fundamental with humans, that, that humans may act a particular way, not because of who they are, but because of their current circumstances. So let's talk about um, how we work with the Sims and then bring those over to humans. So one thing which I discovered in the Sims is that if your Sims are happy, they actually do what you ask them to do. And if the Sims are unhappy, if they're having a miserable time, it's like, hey, you should do your homework, for example, or you should do the washing up. And they're like, ah, screw that, I'm gonna play computer games. So happy Sims generally do what you want. They submit more bug reports or they give you useful patches. So the real thing, oh, oh, sorry, you wanted to read the text there. <laughs> so this is why you should always sit up the front or bring a telescope to my talks. So I've discovered the same thing with real people. If you want somebody to be efficient, then happy people generally are better for that, and very often they actually enjoy helping you. They're a happy person, they give you help, that makes them feel good, they like you more, and they're more productive, it's amazing. The gotcha is finding happy people. And it can't just be, <laughs> it can't just be you need to find any old happy person you need to find like a happy person with the skills and the access and the availability to do what you want. And I found this a lot in consulting. It's like, okay, I need somebody to help me deploy this software or install something on this machine. I can't just ask the barista, hey, can you install Perl 518 on the local servers? They don't have access to do that. They're like, what? I need to ask like one of the DevOps teams or sysadmins or something. So how do I find happy people? I don't recommend you find them. I recommend you engineer them. It's much, much more straightforward. So if anyone here has a security background, computer security background, you'll probably know that if you have physical access to a machine, <laughs> there's a lot more you can do to that machine to change its state. You can open it up, you can pull the hard drives out, you can do all sorts of things. So if you have physical access to a person, you can just directly hack their brain. <laughs> just give them happy drugs and that will make them happy. And then once they've got the happy drugs, you're great. There are two drugs I recommend for like broad use across the population. Um, xanthan alkaloids I use all the time. This is one of my mainstays. 
Uh, the other one you might have heard of, theobromine. Yeah, also known as coffee and chocolate. These are amazing drugs. And as, again, in consulting, I will go to people and say, hey, I made you a coffee. Or, hey, I got you some chocolate. Or, hey, I did both. And the people know, the people know that I'm manipulating them. Like, it's very, very obvious when I walk into the sysadmin's office and I'm there with, like, an amazing latte and some delicious chocolate, they know they're being manipulated. But it's really hard for them to refuse. And in fact, <laughs> because you know, this is like classical conditioning. It's like I'm giving you a reward, you're giving me something back. You know, if they start refusing, they're not going to get the coffee anymore. And, and in fact, <laughs> if it's a small enough task, often I'll get priority. They're like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that right now while I'm drinking this amazing coffee which I've got here. You, know, you often get priority on these things. And they can feel really good about that. Because rather than this is some sort of request which has come through that they've got to work on, it's like, oh, Paul's being really lovely. So this is great if you have physical access and if you've got consent to drug them. If you don't have that, <laughs> if you can't do that, you've got to do other things. What if you can't give them drugs? Well, if we think back to The Sims, there's a few things which people have. They've got needs. If you neglect their needs, they tend to become more miserable. And they have wants and goals. So if you apply, if you sort of cater to those wants and goals, you make them happy. So we can make the lead, uh, fulfill goals. So, you know, here's our person without facial hair. Um, they have needs and goals, but we don't know what they are because we can't see the status bars. The good news is people have default goals. There's this whole sort of basic human operating system with all of these default goals installed. And as we all know, nobody changes the defaults. <laughs> so default goals that you'll find people generally have. One is food. That's why things like chocolate works really well. One is money. People tend to do work for money. That's something which people tend to want. Um, but what I want is to change, not change their goals, but find one of their goals which matches with my needs. So we're both working towards the same thing. We're both getting some sort of a reward out of this, but I'm using one of their goals. And you'd think that's challenging, but it's not. There is one goal that practically everybody has that you can use to help them do your work. And that is a feeling of importance. People like to feel important. So how? So let's pretend I want to impress someone. And um, they might be a work colleague, they might be someone you want to be friends with. For whatever reason, there's somebody there important, you want to impress them. So what you could do is you could talk exclusively about your achievements. And you might even do that when they're backed into a corner so they can't escape hearing about your achievements. And you probably all know those sorts of people. They only talk about themselves. <laughs> you may not actually feel that impressed by them. So if you want to impress another person, what I recommend you do is you talk about them because they are the most important person in their world. Talk about them. So the great way of doing this is by listening to them. Get them talking, have them say something, listen to what they're saying, and then you might have heard this technique before, repeat it back to them. Acknowledge that you've heard what they've said, acknowledge that, and maybe like ask them another question. So if they said they went skiing the other day, you might say, oh, do you go skiing often? Or where did you go skiing? Obviously, they care about skiing. They wouldn't have mentioned it otherwise. So you know, just do that acknowledgement thing. Now, this is called active listening. Um, when you start doing it for the first time, it'll feel really weird. It's like, I already know what they said. They already know what they said. Why do I have to repeat back what they're saying? But it's actually one of these really useful hacks. And um, if you've ever read this, which is like one of the best, creepiest books ever, <laughs> It's great, it goes through that. An interesting thing, for those of you who remember Eliza, like the very, very first, <laughs> Eliza is pure active listening. All Eliza does is wait for you to type something in and responds. Wait for you to type something in, responds. And when Eliza was first like, used on people, they would say, oh wow, you know, I don't know who this person is on the other side of the terminal, but I really like them. They really understand my problems. It's amazing. So active listening, you look smart 
even though you didn't actually have to do anything here. And the reason you look smart is because clearly you are grasping the most important concepts in the world, which is their ideas. So this I can highly recommend if you want to impress other people. You don't need to have any sort of cool stories or anything yourself. You just want to talk to them and let them talk about how wonderful they are. It's really hard when you have two people trying to do this at once, though. <laughs> Other sneaky tricks, making them look good. And ideally, making them look good to their peers. Now, do be careful with this. Um, different people have different levels of comfort. So if you like drag somebody up in front of thousands of people and talk about how wonderful they are, they may not actually feel that comfortable with that. It does depend upon the person. But practically everyone is happy if you do an email to a mailing list that lots of people are on saying, hey, you know, many thanks to Jane for the latest patch. Jane's going to feel pretty good about this. Jane has received public acknowledgement that her work is appreciated and is awesome. So I'm going to look at some case studies here. Now, now, please, when I'm teaching you these, use your powers for good. OK, please use your powers for good. Um, so one of my previous laptops, um, it looked like this. Um, it had a fault with a video card, and it started to look like that, which made me very unhappy. And I desperately wanted to get a new graphics card because I had a conference coming up. I called up Dell, who made the laptop, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll get you one in four to six weeks. And I'm like, are you, you kidding? Like, that's a very long time. I need my, my laptop now. And if you've ever gone looking for like laptop spare parts, they're really hard to find because like, they're made by one manufacturer, and not many people like pulling parts out of their old laptops and selling them on eBay. So I, I called Dell back up, and there was a, a lovely guy on the phone. His name was Alan. I still remember his name. And he said, oh, sir, we can give you expedited shipping, and that will get it to you in only two weeks. Now, for me, that still didn't seem very fast, but it was a hell of a lot better than what I was offered before. And so I said the magic, magic words. Dude, you are awesome. Can I please speak to your manager to tell them how awesome you are? <laughs> Nobody says no to this. Like, everybody wants to say, oh, wow, yeah, my manager can hear about how awesome I am. This is great. And especially if you're some poor person who's like answering phone calls all day in a spare parts department, which takes four to six weeks to get you your parts, the people aren't normally happy. So like, I'm this happy person wanting to give compliments. This worked beautifully. In fact, it worked so well because their manager was on holidays. And they said, oh, well, you can't talk to my manager. You can talk to my manager's manager, <laughs> who happens to be the head of Asia Pacific Spare Parts at Dell. They're out at lunch right now, but here is their name and direct number. <laughs> That was pretty good. So I called them up. I'm like, hey, it's me, um, your, your server staff, Alan. He's amazing, blah, 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 because he's getting me this part so quickly. And at every point along this stage, I said, this is fantastic because I'm getting this part so quickly. And the manager's like, oh, you know, we're going to be uh, seeing the board of directors next week. And we've been really ratted out because apparently we take too long to deliver spare parts. Could you put like, just write a little email or something saying how awesome this is? And I'm like, yeah, sure, not a problem. So I sent this email off about how happy I was with the service because it's arriving quickly. Every point, fast is happy. What was the result here of it going all the way up the chain of command? The result was I kind of made this, the clock there is wrong. Um, it was around about 2 o'clock on the afternoon when I called up Asia Pacific Spare Parts to try and get this thing. And I live in Australia. Um, which is kind of remote. The next morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> I am woken up. I am pulled out of bed because there's this delivery guy on my doorstep with the most urgent parcel he has ever had. <laughs> He woke up that morning in Singapore with the instructions to take this to Australia and deliver it. <laughs> so all the postage on that was way more than the actual cost of my part itself. That was amazing. It was just like, oh my goodness, this works. Other techniques you can use. Putting trust in other people. And this is actually a really, really powerful one. If you trust other people, they have this feeling of responsibility to you, and they don't want to let you down. 
So case number two, um, and this is really where I want to stress, use your powers for good. <laughs> I was on public transport in Melbourne. I did not have a valid ticket. So I had a kind of a valid ticket, but not for the line that I was on. And um, I was going off to an important meeting and ticket inspectors came on the train. I was like, there is no way I'm leaving this train. This meeting is very, very important to me. If I get fined, well, you know, I get fined, but I really don't want to get fined. And, and as they got on the train, I'm like, what can I do to not get a fine? Because I know that they're going to catch me. They go through everyone in the, in the, in the, the carriage. And um, what you don't want to do is sort of slink into your seat and like look really, really guilty and everything because they're going to come over to you. And the way in which they feel good about themselves is by having this power of being able to give fines to other people, to, to penalize people. That makes them feel good because they've got this feeling of power. So I'm like, how can I give them another option? And it's simple. It was like, I'm going to trust them. So I didn't hide. Hiding makes me look guilty. Instead, I walked straight up to them as soon as they got on the train and I explained my situation. I said, I'm so glad that you're here. I don't think that I have a valid ticket and it's been worrying me the entire trip. What should I do? And I'm there with my ticket in my hand doing the puppy dog eyes at this ticket inspector. Can you help me? Now, when you're asking them for help, if they respond by giving me a fine, that's really going to feel like they've betrayed my trust. That's not something that's going to make them feel good about themselves anymore. But I've given them another option, and that's forgiveness. They can forgive me. And so they said, oh, sir, it's very clear that you're quite distressed about this, and you're obviously trying to do the right thing, so just make sure that you buy a valid ticket when you leave the train. And I'm like, really, is that OK? And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's totally fine. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much. This is wonderful. And um, I sat back down, and I actually overheard their conversation later on, where they said, um, I know that I should have found that guy, but he was such a nice guy. <laughs> anyway, please use this for good. Of course. <laughs> of course I purchased the ticket when I got off. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> So the last thing I want to cover um, is hacking bureaucracies. And um, this is actually uh, a really interesting thing because a lot of what I've shown you here are personal techniques. They work really well if you've got one-on-one -on -one interactions with another person. Um, they don't necessarily work very well with large organizations. And one of the gotchas is that with large organizations, if you want to get something done, you kind of need to go up this hierarchy. Getting up that hierarchy is difficult. Now, one thing that does not work very well in most cases is complaints. Large organizations will have a complaint department. <laughs> and the whole point of the complaint department is to act as armor. They don't actually want to like resolve your complaints. It's to like protect everyone else in the business from hearing complaints so those other people can get along with their jobs. So you have these complaint departments to sort of shuffle through these complaints and everything. If they have to, things go up. But you know, a lot of what they're trying to do is diffuse this. What large organizations do not have and completely confuses them is they do not have a compliments department. So if you go to like, you know, a large bank or a telco or something and you want to give them compliments, they don't know what to do with it. So it's like, oh, you should talk to my manager. And they're like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. You should talk to the head of the department. They just keep on going up. <laughs> so case study um, with my bank, I seem to spend a lot of time doing social interactions with banks for some reason. Um, the bank that I was using, and still am using, they're actually quite cool, um, they were looking at like, how do we do online banking? Um, so this is many, many years ago. They're like, how do we do online banking? One of the options which they had, which they said they were trialing, um, was using these little tokens. So you had something which you knew and something which you had, and you could just go to the bank and away you go. The other banks in Australia at the time said, we can use MSIE plugins. That's a great way to authenticate you. And yeah, these were awful. And as a Linux user, and certainly someone who didn't use Internet Explorer, I did not want this to happen. And uh, my bank was experimenting with both. And of course, you know, that's convenient. Um, the other ones are less convenient, but a much, much better security model. So I wrote them a letter. Um, it's like, hey, you know, call them up. I want to write a letter about how wonderful you are. 
And I was like, thank you so much for implementing uh, these security tokens. They're exactly what I want. They're a great idea for all of these things. Lots and lots and lots and lots of praise. And um, it's really, really interesting because I sent this in and I got a, uh, a letter from, not a letter, sorry, a phone call from the head of the IT department at the bank. They actually called me up and they said, hey, look, we've got this letter. Um, we really want to implement these. We think these are the better solution. Um, but we want to be able to present evidence again to the board of directors that this is what we should be doing. Can we use your letter? Can we get you to write a, a few extra things to follow up? And I'm like, yeah, sure, absolutely. So this is essentially me throwing this at the organization, hitting somebody who has the same goals as I do, and then they do the extra work of dragging it further up. And now the bank doesn't have Internet Explorer plugins at all. They all use the tokens. It's absolutely fantastic. So conclusions from this, um, and I have no idea if I've gone over time or not. I suspect I have not gone over time. We'll have plenty of time for questions. Um, rule number one, and I cannot stress this one enough, make other people feel good about themselves. And in fact, if you have any interaction at all, and it does not cause you some sort of personal hardship, do this. Make other people feel good about your, themselves, and you'll build social capital. It's fantastic. You can choose to use drugs. Do try to get consent for that sort of thing. Recognition works really well. Compliments works incredibly well. And if you want to find a cool way of studying humans, playing The Sims is fantastic, even if your friends are zombies. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. So I think I'm absolutely sure I have time for questions. We finish at, is it half past? So I've got 13 minutes for questions, if anybody has questions. Yes, Denise. So, so the, um, the, the question was, what if you use these techniques and your friends point to you and say, you're a sociopath for using these techniques? Um, things I would recommend are making friends with psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> um, because then they don't think you're a sociopath. They ask you, have you read this paper on this thing that you're doing right now? <laughs> Which is really, really useful. It also means that if you're hanging out with friends who are not psychologists, the, the friend of yours who is like a, a, a criminal psychologist who like works for, for the prison and like determines whether or not people are sort of safe to be released into society, society, it's like, no, I've already done a psych profile on Paul. He's okay. He's, he's not actually a sociopath. I actually have a piece of paper from someone exactly like that saying I'm not a sociopath. Did, did you forge yours as well? Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you very much. You're a fantastic audience. Grab me any time. I'll talk your ear off about this. Thank you.